Hello, intelligent beings of the Etherweb! Countries, regions, cities, towns around the world as of recent tend to have a tourist slogan. Moscow government have officially introduced a slogan too in 2015 – Не просто город – that can be translated to not just a city, but explain that it's not really used on practice. Chances are higher of encountering in another half-official slogan. It first was introduced for the 865th anniversary of the city and was reintroduced for the city's official summer music festivals, as it is learned from a Soviet song. It is Lutshi Gorod Zimli, the best city in the world. The website created for the anniversary was since abandoned and bought by cyber squatters, and the I Left Moscow websites and social media accounts that were created for the best city in the world campaign since closed or were abandoned as well. The best city in the world could not bother to safe keep the slogan even with all the media resources, yet everywhere on every telescreen or newspaper the city government controls, we see them clinging to the idea of Moscow's supposed superiority. Moscow is not just a city indeed. Welcome to the story of the best city in the world, the story of the city on seven hills, the port of five seas, the White Stone City, the Golden Headed City, the story of the Third Rome. Welcome to the story of Moscow. Moscow is where my family had found themselves after the tragedy of the Bolshevik Revolution. From St. Petersburg, Warsaw, Kiev, we condensed in Moscow. This is where my great great uncle became a world class figure in classical music teaching. This is the city for protecting which, in the Battle of Moscow, my grand-grandfather was decorated in World War II. This is where my grandmother have moved to in her teenage years to study classical music. This is where my grandfather was born two months before his father was shot near Moscow by Soviet authorities. All the while, many of my extended family was murdered in Nazi-occupied Ukraine and Poland. My birth certificate is still a Soviet-styled book. But born was I in Moscow, the capital of the new Russian Federation. In Moscow I attended a school, had to leave it, graduated from another one. In Moscow I attended a university, was kicked from there, graduated from another one. Moscow is my current residency, despite the lack of opportunities, each day being worse than the previous one and with no future. Staying in Moscow is like staying in a permanent Kabayashi Maru scenario. Moscow spreads solitude and despair perhaps as, if not more efficient than Hong Kong. Many of the things that are being said here can be extrapolated to the whole country. Moscow serves as the focal point of many of the curiosities of the whole way of the country's existence. This is why we are looking at Moscow, because someone can reject my knowledge of all of Russia, but not of Moscow. Also can be denied my experience with long-term living outside of Moscow in Seoul, or more precisely Yongning in Kongido, south of Seoul, where I stayed for a university exchange program. Cividale del Friuli near Udine in Italy, where I briefly was an assistant teacher in Russian, and Tokyo are two other places where a significant number of weeks were spent. My personal familiarity with urban localities includes other places in Russia, St. Petersburg in particular, and globally, among other places, more of Japan, Republic of Korea, Israel, Finland, Sweden, Germany, Northern Italy, Ukraine, Hong Kong, and Canada. All of the footage is own, except for the content of screen captures. All of the footage was filmed either before early 2020 or in late summer and early autumn of 2020 while wearing a mask. Note that the footage taken within Moscow Metro does not comply with the rule of Moscow Metro 2.11.13 forbidding any filming on Moscow Metro premise. This story is divided into four parts and multiple sections, with the sections as well as particular topics raised marked with timestamps in the descriptions of the videos. Also marked are the sources for all the captured websites. The channel is not monetized and not sponsored. From the sheer act of watching there are no monetary or any other benefits coming my way. Russia is a stratified, unequal country, an unequal society. There are multiple levels of inequality. A person with governmental or organized crime connections, which is pretty much the same thing, would stand on top of those without those connections. Russian citizen of Russian ethnicity, in general, stands on top of Russian citizens of non-Russian ethnicity, 
and both stand on top of non-citizens. Moscow is the place where one can, maybe supposedly, but stand on top of the rest of the country. For many, the only way up in life is to move to a regional capital, then to a megacity, and from there the final destination could only be Moscow. Some of the megacities like St. Petersburg, Novosibirsk or Yekaterinburg do compete with Moscow, but once in Moscow, in general, the only way up is to move overseas. Usually, talking of this unfair arrangement in Russian results in a shouting match in the comments, as people do defend their cities, towns and regions, and righteously so. But this does not change the unfair structure of the regional division of modern-day Russia. Moscow is not just a city, it is the seat of all the Russian ministries, the Russian government, the seat of the dictator. This is where all the choices are made. This is where all the taxes go from the regions to be then redistributed back based on the loyalty. The president's seat is within a medieval fortress of Kremlin, and the unfair imperial arrangement that goes against the theoretical federative nature of the federation is as centralized as the Chinese authority was during the heights of the dynasties. Moscow is the city with unprecedented lavish corruption-filled expenditures it is the city with all the government persons bringing misery into lives of all, the city with the highest incomes. It is no wonder that Moscow invokes envious hatred in the souls of the rest of the country. It is the place that brings misery, and it is the place where, despite all of that, many want to be. A Moscow resident is inadvertently, despite all of the miseries we might endure, is privileged like were privileged the residents of Elizabethan London in so many aspects. This spot on the ground is a symbolic place where all the roads of Russia are measured from. It is the zero kilometer of Russia. You are supposed to throw a coin behind your back for luck there. Luck theoretically should come if the coin lands in the center. On practice, it comes to those who collect the coins. Moscow can seem like the best city in the world, it seems like the best city in the world, if one escaped poverty or even war. This, however, puts the bar of bestness quite low. Each citizen of Russia is obliged to have an internal passport, where residence and military status is recorded. This document is required everywhere. We needed to get a package from a post office. We needed to buy tickets to all long-distance trains, all express trains with seats and intercity buses. We needed to even buy tickets to an Aero Express train connecting Moscow with three of its four airports. Failure to present the passport to the authorities can get one detained for up to two days. This passport does not allow for one little thing – traveling overseas. Except for Belarus, Armenia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Russia-backed Abkhazia and South Ossetia, and insurgency-controlled areas of Ukraine. To travel elsewhere, a Russian citizen must pay for an international passport, which is a passport in its original sense. However, three quarters of Russian citizens do not have one. Six to seven out of ten people in the country have never ever left the ex-USSR. Numerous people do not have a right to leave the country. Millions of police officers, National Guard, Border Patrol, Federal Security officers are only allowed to visit a small number of countries, and only if their superiors permit it. Scientists and engineers in many fields from robotics to physics are not allowed to leave because of supposed secrecy. Having an international passport alone would not grant full freedom of travel. Getting a visa required to travel to United States, United Kingdom, Ireland, Australia, New Zealand and Canada is not an easy task to say the least. Many are not eligible as they are deemed potential immigrants. United Kingdom have denied issuing me a visitor visa in 2019. Japan, Schengen area Europe and India are much friendlier with issuing visas but it does not compare with the simple ability to board a ferry or a train or a plane without a need for a visa. Very few prosperous democratic countries accept Russian citizens as is, but most locations are difficult to consider when many have much limited funds for travel, if any. As a result, the majority of people in Russia do not have any experience with the outside world. Even if they do, way too often it is limited to isolated resorts in Turkey or Egypt, or to short bus tours to Central Europe. Thirty years ago, a Soviet requirement to get an exit visa to leave the country was dropped. But to this day, Moscow can allow itself to claim to be the best city in the world, as the world is largely excluded from the competition in the eyes of most people. Moscow, like in this coronavirus infographic, could be compared to Verona, Seoul, Tokyo, Lisboa, Singapore, when it is beneficial for the narrative presented by the city government, 
however far from reality this narrative might be. But whenever it is not beneficial, the sheer idea that somewhere can do things better than Moscow will be denied. The comparisons will be denied on the basis of climate, forgetting Hokkaido, Canada or even Finland with Norway and Sweden. The comparisons will be denied on the basis of size, this way attempted to negate comparisons to the cities of Europe. But forgetting that the world is not exactly Europe alone, and there exist comparatively large cities on the planet, the ones like Seoul and Tokyo, which sure will be mentioned on multiple occasions in this story. Moscow is one of the largest and populous cities in the world. It is arguably the most populous city in Europe, competing only with Istanbul, if you ignore that Istanbul is divided between Europe and Asia. Moscow is definitely more populous than Paris, London or Madrid. Inside Moscow population-wise can fit Sweden with Finland on top, or perhaps Ireland with Northern Ireland, Scotland and maybe Wales. The estimations are hard to make as the census is 10 years late, and the borders of the actual city are fuzzy. Moscow is a federal city, and it is surrounded and intertwined with Moskovskaya Oblast. Moscow Oblast, another federal subject. There are metro stations with some exits in both Moscow and Moscow Oblast, and often it is difficult to notice when Moscow changes into Moscow Oblast. But despite the imaginary border, the legal border is strict. Oblast is a different federal subject. Moscow, like the country, is highly centralized and not being controlled democratically. Moscow government, Meria, is controlled by the mayor Sergei Sabyanin, a loyal servant of Vladimir Putin. His infamy is such that he is occasionally being referred to as SS, and the chant in the background is Sabyanin is a thief. It is quite an appropriate chant considering that one can spend weeks reading on all the corruption schemes he, his subordinates and Moscow government controlled by him are involved with. The mayor's positive comments for 2020 Moscow's 873rd anniversary concluded with the best city in the world slogan. They were greeted with much disdain in the replies written by people not buying into false positivity. The only reason why SS is there is that the alternative candidates since 2013 are not allowed to participate in the elections, and the 2013 elections are largely controversial themselves as Sergei Sabanin, a loyal servant of Vladimir Putin, narrowly avoided a second round, where he'd compete directly with Alexei Navalny. The next chant upcoming is Moscow without Sabanin. In addition to Meria, there is Gradskaya Duma, city parliament, which has limited power, but that was enough for the electoral committee to bar most democratic candidates from running in the elections in 2019, despite the protests with only few in the minority making it to the ballot to subsequently be elected. This chant We are for Sobol for Lyubov in support of Lyubov Sobolban from the elections can be interpreted as We are for love, as Lyubov means love. Moscow is divided into 12 administrative округа, administrative districts, with their governments sitting in large buildings doing who knows what. The only recent piece of news about administrative district governments that I can think of is how one had a teddy bear in the chair. The actual division are 125 boroughs or districts or neighborhoods, rayone, and this is the only level of direct control, where some of the democratic candidates managed to take hold, attracting attention with even the nearly non-existent power that they have, like Ilya Yashin in Krasnoselsky district. This is similar to the democratic victory in district councils of Hong Kong. Some of the districts of Moscow are as densely populated as districts of Hong Kong, with Zyablikovo and Novokosino being roughly equal to the eastern district of Hong Kong, with 31,000 residents per one square kilometer. However, there is a slight issue with local activism in Moscow. Local activists who focus on the city seem to focus on the city's center and often focus on the symptoms. On the contrary, Alexei Navalny's movement in Moscow or people like Yulia Galyamina or Ilya Yashin would speak of the country's injustices and problems in general, but some of the others might prefer to stay within a broken framework. The urbanist movement of the 2010s even partially embraced Sergei Sabyanin. Many seem to like the idea of enlightened absurdism, a monarch who will build well and make the SimCity map look nice, like Peter the Great who toured Europe and liked European technology but hated parliaments. With a lack of democratic control and choices made on a whim by a small ungoverned group, 
The city government always does one step forward to ten steps backwards. With unprecedented amount of funds to spend, the government tries to polish the surface, not realizing that they are the rust below. Imagine if in Stockholm every resident had to commute to Gamalastan to make a decent living, or in London everyone had to go to, say, Westminster. This would make everything horrible, unbearable car traffic, crowded public transit. Ancient buildings would have been demolished to build offices. We just described Moscow. Moscow is a circular city, and everything pretty much happens within the Garden Circle motorway, or the Circle Line of Moscow Metro. It is roughly the historic center of Moscow before the 20th century. Restaurants, events, museums, all the fun is inside there. In the morning, millions of people go from their sleeping districts to the center, and in the evening they return home to sleep. In Seoul, or in Kongido, or in Tokyo, there will be a ton of small shops and private businesses in nearly every urban area. Away from a metro station in Moscow, one can at best expect a middle-sized supermarket, a pharmacy and a post office. Sometimes a shawarma corner and a place to buy alcohol. For anything fancier, well, go to the city center. Or to a mall. Because Moscow was filled with malls since the thousands. The malls were plopped everywhere. How about a mall almost at the Red Square? And I'm not talking about the historic one. How about a mall in place of the open area in front of Kursky Rail Terminal? Or a small mall in front of a house? In 2012, Moscow government have eaten a huge territory south of Moscow, calling it New Moscow, Nova Moskva, stretching the border for up to 77 kilometers away from the city center. But all of Moscow is controlled directly from Tverskaya Street. The arrangement is far from Tokyo Prefecture with independent special wards, or even London's boroughs. Those who control Moscow perhaps only care about what they see around their Tverskaya street and what they see from the windows of their cars. Similarly, how the country's government sees things, what's behind the garden circle might as well be to them a foreign colony. The pressure of everyone clustering in the city center results in historic buildings demolished en masse and prices of residences within or near the garden circle being times more compared to the outside. And I knew people who are hooked on living where the fun is ready to pay extra. We, who live closer to the border of the city, are second grade. This is perhaps better in a sense, as with lesser overlook there are places where the weeds can grow, and people can dance like in docks of spaceports in Firefly. But when the authorities come, they do so with demolitions and literal nuclear waste. Soon after filming, the pretty wild weeds from a street corner were cut and left as a garbage pile. Moscow is a city of uncertainties. Recently I was walking to buy a sandwich, and National Guard was entering an apartment building I passed by. When the story was being compiled, one day I woke up and found out that there is no water. I left to see if there is a notice of maintenance. No notice. The water soon was back. Actually, water outages are a norm in Moscow, if we are talking about hot water outages. Urban areas in Russia tend to have centralized heating and centralized hot water production. The water is heated alongside energy production on power plants or at large heating facilities. This is an effective arrangement when it works. Sometimes a few times a year, when trying to take a hot bath, there's brown unpleasantness. Sometimes the water isn't hot enough for a bath, and in the summer we have 10 days without hot water. These 10 days are scheduled in advance, but we need to be careful and check the dates online, as the official notice on the building might be posted just a day or two before the outage. Moreover, the water might start being less hot a day or two before set outage too. One is lucky if they have very close friends or relatives in other districts with a different hot water outage time, or go to a gym with showers, but even that is uncomfortable and it is kind of a disaster in the pandemic to rely on visits to other people and places to take a shower. The city had postponed turning off the water for June of 2020, but only did so until the vote to change the constitution took place on July the 1st. Note that some hotels might not have their own water heaters, and when visiting in summer during the outage, you might end up with either no hot water or with something like that, witnessed personally in St. Petersburg, but not impossible to see in Moscow. At your flat, it's also good to have an electric heater or an air conditioner with a heating function, despite the centralized heating. Centralized heating works the same as centralized hot water supply. In Moscow it is done using specially prepared hot water pipes through the radiators. The system works well in the middle of the winter, but it is filled with inefficiencies. 
The heat losses upon delivery are massive. Unnecessary overheating often happens in warm periods in autumn and spring. With the exception of the newest radiators, there is no control, and if it's too hot, the only solution is to open the windows. The opposite is what's more unpleasant. The time for turning on and off the heating is predetermined, and even if adjusted based on the weather, it can be on too late or be off too early. Water in Moscow is technically drinkable, and drinking it won't kill. But it's not on par with Tokyo or Stockholm. The knowledge to drink only boiled or filtered water is something that is present in most of those who were born in Soviet and post-Soviet cities, including Moscow. There are no public water fountains in the city because of that, and the only way to get water is to buy a bottle. Speaking of public, the city barely has any decent public toilets, especially outside the city center. Free ones are even more rare. There is only a handful of free ones in the center. Free or not, none are shiny to say the least. This one is just a few hundred meters away from the Kremlin. Previously, the city had installed questionable looking golden toilets, also not quite shiny and also not free. The toilets recently installed at the few metro stations aren't free either, unlike the toilets of stations in Japan or Korea. There is a common saying that the largest network of free public toilets in Moscow is McDonald's. And in some areas like Pushkinska Square or Chiste Prudy, this is perhaps the main reason why people visit McDonald's without even buying anything. The underpass dance and music scene shown earlier took place under a recently constructed northeastern Horde motorway, plopped right down through the whole Vishniki district. Despite there being two exits from the adjacent metro station, only one underpass was constructed, creating a bottleneck and adding hundreds of meters to the daily commute of many. Nobody listened to people. On February the 9th, 2016, the city have demolished hundreds of private businesses in an event that became popularly known as Noch Dlinnych Kavshei, the Night of Long Excavator Scoops, named such after the Nazis' Night of the Long Knives. Hundreds of private business owners saw their property right nullified based on supposed errors in paperwork filled during construction 20 years ago. Shops, cafes, restaurants all were demolished with no way to object and no compensation. Small business is pretty much seen as a nuisance for the country and the city. The city government had told us that it is a part of a beautification program, but once again outside of the city center only destruction was gifted and no beauty. This concrete nothingness was a row of shops and cafes that was demolished in Vyhina. Before that a large market in Vishniki was demolished. And supposedly to compensate for local farming produce, the city have introduced a small weekend market nearby, but which is assembled and disassembled each weekend by city workers. Doesn't seem very efficient. The nullification of property rights, like what was done for private businesses, was similarly repeated for the residents of the five-story apartment buildings. Many of these built during Nikita Khrushchev's rule in 50s and 60s as a quick way to compensate the lack of housing are indeed questionable, but not all. And will the newly rebuilt districts be better? The residents can't truly object to the relocation, but a few areas manage to nudge themselves out. People shall be given apartments in high-rise buildings constructed with special renovation allowances, meaning poorer quality and poorer safety. All while many of the buildings in dire need of relocation are ignored. The slogan written here is Stroim Lubimoy Gorod, Building the Beloved City, while in practice it feels more like Destroim. At the same time, a hospital can look like this. Moscow, despite having the best healthcare in the country, still would make one wish they have money to pay for private hospitals and doctors instead of relying on state hospitals and state polyclinics with tired staff. The medical workers are praised as heroes during the pandemic, but if they complain about the conditions, they are prosecuted. The highest wages in the country that Moscow medical and budget workers receive are still substandard, and decent living requires one to burn themselves on the job. The supposedly rich and prosperous nature of Moscow hides quite a high level of poverty, even among working people. All while the individual attempts to relieve, say, omnipresent homelessness are met with the official opposition. Moscow is prosperous in the eyes of the regime, and so all the issues are not to be noticed. No wonder where pretty much almost the leadership in a global statistic of suicide rates comes from. The lack of hope and future for people of all ages leads to all sorts of substance abuses, with a lack of opportunities for young leading to walls and roads filled with calls for high-risk, high-reward drug dealer jobs. The city in the country offers no help, only long prison sentences. 
most would think that a workhouse is something from Victorian Britain, but this advertisement is for jobs in what's called a workhouse, and this advertisement for workhouse jobs is printed in Comic Sans. Even if someone is actually rich and prosperous, they would be looking for a quick buck, because if they are not, they can't be sure if they won't be imprisoned, or some new law would make their business illegal. In Moscow, you can't be sure about the future, can't hope for the future, can't plan for the future. In Moscow, each rain is a return to flooding, because the rain collection system is inadequate at best and non-existent at most. Each heavy snow results in stalling of the city, as if it's not Moscow in Russia, but Jerusalem. Moscow is perhaps one of the most geologically stable megacities with more than 10 million inhabitants on the planet. Yet the amount of uncertainties here is more than what someone would be facing near an active volcano in Japan, with all of these uncertainties completely avoidable and human-made. Raccoon Hanks, everyone! This four-part story will be continued in three following parts. Remember to subscribe here and on Patreon, remember to show this series to others and look at the slice of life paintings of mine. And remember that the word Grishdanin is derived from Borod, like Med Borgyari is from Borg, Shimin is from Shi, Politis is from Polis, and Citizen is from City.